Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Christ Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours. Christ died for sins once for all, We confess our sins. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Because of Christ's sacrifice, the Lord washes away all your iniquity and cleanses you from your sin. He hides his face from your sins and blots out all your iniquity. In his unfailing love and great compassion, Jesus has saved you. Loving and kind Savior, accept the worship we offer to you. Turn our minds and hearts to your word. Build up our trust in you who suffered and died in our place. In your name we pray. You may be seated. We listen to the third part of the Passion History according to the Gospel of Mark. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the servant girls of the high priest came there. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you are saying. And he went out to the entryway. Then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him once more, she began to tell those standing there, This is one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while, those who were standing there said to Peter, Surely you are one of them because you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and to swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Just then the rooster crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests, along with the elders, the experts in the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, It is as you say. The chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate questioned him again, Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus still did not answer anything, so Pilate was amazed. At each festival, Pilate used to release to the people one prisoner whom they requested. There was one named Barabbas who was in prison with the rebels and had committed murder in the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Pilate replied, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? In fact, he knew it was because of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Again, Pilate replied to them, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted back. But Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted even louder, Crucify him. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. After he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, which is called the Praetorium, and called together the whole cohort of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns, and put it on him. The soldiers began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! They kept hitting him on the head with a reed and spitting on him. They also kneeled down to pay homage to him. This is the third part of the Passion history. Let's speak together the seasonal response for Lent. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We sing the next hymn, O Dearest Jesus, 117, stanzas 1 through 5.
In the name of Jesus, our dear and loving Savior. Dear Christian friends, for our midweek Lenten services, we have been turning to God's word for Old Testament pictures of Jesus' passion. This evening, we are going to meditate on Psalm 22. You will find the whole psalm printed out on the ivory-colored half sheet in your service folder, broken down by the sections that I'll be reading throughout the sermon. You may have this in front of you if you wish to follow along while I read those sections. Psalm 22 is a vivid portrayal of Jesus' passion on the cross. Have you ever wondered what was on Jesus' heart while he was suffering there on the cross? The Passion History records for us the seven statements that Jesus spoke, so we know what he said, but what was on his heart during that time? This Old Testament picture of Jesus' passion allows us a window into his heart during his passion on the cross. In these words from the Psalms, Jesus reveals his severe agony and also his deep trust. The Psalm begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, and am not silent. The speaker felt forsaken by God. The author of this psalm was David, shepherd, later king over Israel. David may have very well had times in his life when he felt abandoned by the Lord. After he was anointed king and before he in fact became king, he was hunted by King Saul for many years. Maybe he felt abandoned then. After he was king for a long time, one of his sons, Absalom, rebelled against him and David had to flee Jerusalem. Maybe he felt forsaken then too. You recognize these words, though, as words spoken by Jesus on the cross. That first line one of Jesus' statements while he agonized on the cross. Whatever level of suffering that David experienced, which may have made him feel like he was forsaken by God, all of that was only a small foreshadowing of Jesus' severe agony when he was crucified. Really, it's Jesus himself speaking through David in Psalm 22. Jesus was forsaken by his heavenly Father. He did that for us. Every one of us admits before God that we deserve to be forsaken by God. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is lawlessness against God. Daily we sin. The just holy and righteous God has every right to send every sinner to hell to be forsaken by him forever. But Jesus chose to experience that state of being forsaken by God for us. That had to have been the most severe agony that he experienced. Jesus the Son, his Father, God the Father, had a close relationship, the closest and most perfect relationship from all of eternity. Then that relationship on the cross was severed when Jesus bore our sin. It even seemed like Jesus' prayers went unanswered. He was forsaken, abandoned by his Father as he carried our sin. Because he did. We've been restored to God. Because we are not guilty of sin on account of what Christ experienced, we have peace with God, the scriptures teach us. In Christ and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We are not forsaken by God now. We will never be forsaken by God because Jesus endured that severe agony of being abandoned by God during his passion on the cross. 
in his heart, Jesus then goes from agony to deep trust, starting at verse 3. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. While Jesus was in agony on the cross, he recalled God's faithfulness in the past. The fathers, Jesus says, trusted in you. The fathers were believers from long ago during the Old Testament era. They trusted in the Lord and he delivered them. Let's take a few examples. The Israelites were trapped at the Red Sea with the armies of Egypt boring down on them. It looked like they were lost. They cried out to God for help. The Lord opened up the Red Sea. They crossed through on dry land. The armies of the Egyptians went into the Red Sea. The waters came back and destroyed them all. They trusted in the Lord and were rescued. At another time in Israel's history, it looked like the nation was facing calamity and disaster. The army of the Assyrians was at the gates of Jerusalem ready to take the city. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, prayed to the Lord. He trusted in God. He asked for deliverance. God sent an angel that killed almost all the soldiers in the Assyrian army. They were delivered. Or remember Daniel in the lion's den, put there because he prayed to God and not to the king. He went to God in his trust, prayed for deliverance. God closed the mouths of the lions and rescued Daniel. As Jesus was agonizing on the cross, he recalled how God in the past always came to the aid of his people as they prayed to him in distress. And Jesus found comfort and hope in what God had done in the past. He delivered the fathers. He would also deliver Jesus. God does not disappoint those who trust in him. We take comfort from that fact too. No matter what situation we're in, no matter what kinds of hardships we are confronting, we simply trust in God and have the confidence he will rescue and deliver us because he never disappoints those who trust in him. Jesus, again in the psalm, expresses his severe agony, starting at verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Another part of Jesus' agony was being scorned and despised. You have that image in your mind of Jesus on the cross with all the people around him mocking him and scorning him and despising him. His fellow Jews, the priests, the Roman soldiers, even, even the criminals on each side, at one point both were hurling insults at Jesus. They brought into question his relationship with his heavenly Father. Jesus spoke about his trust in his Father. He said, I and the Father are one. He put into practice his trust in his heavenly Father. But there at the cross, Jesus' enemies said in a challenging and mocking way, well, why don't you trust in him now? Maybe he'll come and rescue you and deliver you. Such mockery and abuse heaped on Jesus. It was all blasphemy against Christ and against God. And on another level, it was simply cruel and inhumane. Let's try to put what Jesus experienced in a slightly different context. Someone has been diagnosed with a, with a mortal illness. He goes into hospice care at home. So hospice nurses are coming in. Family and friends are coming in to offer comfort and support. But then some people come who didn't really care for that person and start insulting him and mocking him and insulting him. How cruel and how inhumane toward a person who is suffering. That's a part of what Jesus endured while he was on the cross. 
He was willing to take that because he was there for us, suffering and dying in our place. Then as we listen to Jesus and have a window into his heart, we hear him again expressing his trust, starting at verse 9. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Jesus trusted in his Father all his life. From the very beginning, from the womb, at his mother's breast, from birth, Jesus trusted in his heavenly Father. That trust remained a constant through every stage of Jesus' life as he was growing up. And the Father was always well pleased with his son, Jesus. Jesus trusted perfectly, unlike us. What were we at birth? What were we at conception? We were, we were sinful. Sinful from the time that our mothers conceived us. Our trust waxes and wanes because of our weakness at times. We know we should trust, but we don't really trust that much at all. Jesus' trust was perfect throughout his whole life. And he was trusting in God in our place because so often we don't. In that trust, while he agonized, he pleaded for help. There was Jesus on the cross with, with nobody around him who could really help. There were his enemies who were, who were mocking him and insulting him. There were a few friends, his mother and another woman or two, John the Apostle, maybe some others, but they were really helpless to do anything for Jesus in his agony. But he still trusted in his heavenly Father as the one source for his rescue. In the day of trouble, he called on God waiting for his father to deliver him. Then as we get this window into Jesus' heart, we hear him talk in detail about his severe agony, starting at verse 12. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Such agony that Jesus experienced on the cross, which, which he spoke about deep down in his heart. As we sing in one of our Lenten hymns, was there ever grief like his? Let's just go through each of these agonizing experiences that Jesus endured. His enemies were like bulls and lions and wild dogs, vicious animals who were attacking him. Would you want to be in the midst of wild bulls and ferocious lions and, and ravenous dogs? There was Jesus among his enemies who had no mercy at all for him but kept pouring out their murderous rage against him. Jesus was physically and totally exhausted. He felt like he was water being poured out. His bones were all out of joint, and you can picture Jesus on the cross there with his arms and his legs spread out, and probably some of his bones literally out of joint while he agonized. He was thirsty, as we hear him say in the Passion history. He was so dried out, so tired out, he wanted a drink of water before he died. Jesus also was pierced in his hands and in his feet. We're not told in the psalm exactly how that happened, but, but you know from the gospel record that nails pierced his hands and nails pierced his feet as, as he was fixed to the cross and, 
and became immobile. He couldn't, couldn't even move his arms or his legs. He was stuck there to the cross with nails through his hands and his feet. While on the cross, he was exposed to the crowds as, as he suffered. People were gazing at Christ while he went through this severe agony. Some among us have been through some very severe agony and and some of us will have some severe agony in the future. Would you want to be in a crowd of people while you were going through some very painful experience? We'd we'd rather be with ourselves and just with a few people who are close to us but not not out in the public as we agonize. There was Jesus nailed to the cross with with people around him viewing him in in his extreme suffering mocking and abusing him. And then people divided his garments and gambled for his clothes. The last few earthly possessions that Jesus had were taken away from him and gambled away by the soldiers. What severe agony he experienced. Jesus was willing to go all that way for us. He went the extra mile and and way beyond the extra mile in order to rescue us. He truly, truly loves us. Whenever we might have some doubts about God's love, one place to go in the scriptures is right here in Psalm 22 where we are given this window into Jesus' heart and, and just take some time to meditate on our Lord's description of what he suffered for us because of his great love for you and me. And let's take one other really brief lesson from this part of Psalm 22. So much that Jesus went through when he was crucified was predicted in great detail right here in this psalm. God's word is definitely true. It's proven as prophecy was fulfilled. We can trust God's word with all our hearts. As we approach the end of the psalm, we hear more expressions of the Lord's trust, starting at verse 19. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. As Jesus was agonizing, he kept pleading with his heavenly Father. He did not give up. He did not quit. He he saw the goal ahead of of him to be accomplished through his sufferings, the goal of rescuing from sin, death, and and the power of the devil. So he endured and he persisted. And finally, he was delivered. God the Father strengthened and sustained Jesus throughout all of his agony. So then, of his own accord, he could lay down his life. Nobody took it from him. But he laid it down by his own choice for us after he paid the full price of our sins. And then he was fully vindicated, fully rescued by his heavenly Father when he was raised from the dead. His body was not abandoned to the grave, but God the Father raised him on the third day. Jesus trusted in him and he was delivered. God has listened to my cry for help. Jesus urges us then to keep praising the Lord. He raised up his servant Jesus. After Christ agonized in our place, we are forgiven, we are saved. Let's keep praising Christ for what he endured. Let's keep praising him for his perfect trust while he suffered on the cross. And then finally, in the last section of the psalm, we hear more declarations from Jesus of his joy over God's deliverance and his promises to us who trust in him. Starting at verse 25 and reading to the end of the psalm. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. 
The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. So ends this Old Testament picture of our Savior's passion. A glimpse given to us into the heart of our Savior while he suffered, showing his severe agony and his perfect trust. He was delivered, and so we are saved. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray. Loving Lord Jesus, as we stand before you in worship and consider your passion as pictured in the Old Testament, we remember how you suffered and died for us. You gave your innocent life into death and death on a cross for us and for all sinners. We marvel at your perfect trust in the midst of your severe agony. We rejoice over your great love for us, which compelled you to suffer as you did. Fill us with ongoing joy and peace over what you accomplished for us with your passion on the cross. Dearest Savior, we ask you to keep us from ever viewing our sins lightly, but work in us sincere repentance. Help us to put our thankful love to you into practice by putting to death the deeds of our flesh, and abandoning every impulse that runs against your holy will. Comfort us in times of hurt and loneliness with the gospel fact that we will never be forsaken by God since you were forsaken in our place. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church who supplies gospel servants to congregations and schools. With your help and guidance, our Trinity voters this past Sunday called Mr. Zachary Savickle to serve as 8th grade teacher at Trinity St. Luke's Lutheran School. We ask that as he prayerfully considers this divine call, you would guide him to a decision that is in the best interest of your kingdom. As we await his decision, bless Trinity, St. Luke's, and our school so that your kingdom may continue to grow and flourish among us. Hear all of our prayers offered in your name as we also pray together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Dearest Savior, we thank you for blessing us in our worship this evening. Keep before the eyes of our faith your suffering and death so that we are comforted in every trouble and affliction. We ask you to sustain us through your words of comfort and peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on, look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
It was good for us to be here this evening, to be encouraged from God's word as we meditated on our Savior in his passion. Just a reminder, we have one more midweek Lenten service less. That's, that's next Wednesday. We're having five this year because two weeks from today, we will return to our regular schedule with one evening service at 6.30. That will be the Wednesday before Palm Sunday. So we will mark Palm Sunday that Wednesday and then also on the Sunday itself. So next Wednesday, our last midweek Lenten service, 3.30 and 6.30. Two weeks from today, one service. It'll be Palm Sunday. That'll be our theme on that Wednesday for worship at 6 o'clock. May the Lord bless your evening.